Hello, and welcome to what I hope will be the first of perhaps a weekly, perhaps more, perhaps less, a series of videos in which I will talk about historical names which are in the news. And the name I want to talk about today is Thomas Lineker. It's in the news because he gave his name to a 1960s, only 1960s, graduate college at Oxford. And the college has recently decided, in the light of 150 million or so donation from a Vietnamese um, oligarch, female oligarch, to rename itself after her name. Well, the decision, I suppose, is it's mercenary. It's Philistine and, most interestingly, it's hypocritical because the billionaire locally is known as the Bikini Billionaire. She made her money out of a budget airline uh, in Southeast Asia which first advertised itself with air hostesses wearing bikinis. So, as well as mercenary, as well as Philistine, it is completely hypocritical. In other words, the renaming is typical of the modern Oxbridge. Philistine, hypocritical and mercenary, mercenary, mercenary. Anyway, enough about that. The important thing is Thomas Lineker. Lineker is vaguely, vaguely remembered nowadays as an important humanist. That's a scholar of the rediscovered, effectively the rediscovered classical Greek and the reworked classical Latin that becomes fashionable in Europe in the late 15th century. And he's also an important doctor, a medic, a physician. Um, as I said, sort of remembered, and it was very appropriate that the college, uh, the 1960s college, was named after him at Oxford because he leaves a very significant donation. He's rich. He leaves a very significant donation to both Oxford and Cambridge for educational purposes, met the purposes of reforming medical education, and neither of them really work. So uh, in the 60s, he was honoured, you know, 400 years late, well, what's Oxbridge? And now he's been, well, dishonoured again and his legacy ignored. I'm going to talk about uh, Lineker because he's very interesting in himself, but he also represents something else. He represents a what if, a might have been. Because if knowledge had gone in a different direction, if it had developed in different ways, Lineker wouldn't be this marginal figure that, you know, petty dons could ignore. He'd be up there with Erasmus. He'd be up there even with Luther. But it didn't. And we're going to see why. Who is he? We don't really know much about his origins. It's guessed that he comes from a mile or two of where I'm actually recording this video in Kent. That's to say, somewhere around Canterbury. He's born perhaps 1460, bright lad. Uh, again, we know nothing of his social origins. He goes off to Oxford, um, does well, becomes a fellow of all souls. And then in the decade of the 1490s, so he's about 30, he spends the whole decade in Italy. We think he goes there in the company of a fellow Kentishman, William Selling. That's the, his name in religion, uh, the name that he took when he became a monk of the great monastery of Christ Church in Canterbury, which is now the cathedral. Um, and William Selling becomes the prior, and he is one of the most advanced scholars of the day in those two areas. I was talking about uh, Greek studies and the advanced revival of classical Latinity. And they, uh, he goes frequently to uh, to Rome uh, in the service of, I think, actually, of Richard III, and then certainly and frequently in the service of Henry VII. In other words, something else I'm going to be talking about, this extraordinary increase of closeness 
of relations with Rome uh, under both the Yorkist king, at least Richard III, and Henry VII, that, as it were, prefaces the extraordinary rupture of those relations under Henry VIII. Anyway, uh, young, or comparatively young, academically young, Lineker goes off to Italy. What does he go off to do? Well, he doesn't seem to get to Rome uh, with Selling's uh, embassy. Instead, he stops short. He stops in Florence. This is the Florence of the early days of the Medici, the early days of the Medici court. And the Medici see themselves as the great patrons of the new learning, the new humanism, and they're especially interested in Greek. And he spends, Lenica spends, a couple of years in Florence, sitting at the feet of the great Greek scholars that were assembled around the Medici court, and also meeting, uh, we think, in fact, maybe even for certain, the future Medici Pope, um, Leo X, so two very important years. And then he does finally get to Rome, and he's by this point an established scholar, and he becomes custos, or warden, of the English hospital there, the English college, the hospital of St Thomas, you know, just not very far, actually, from the Vatican. And that's the centre of the English community uh, in Rome, uh, a mixture of lawyers, of pilgrims, of scholars, lawyers negotiating with the uh, papal court. And he is, uh, as Custos, he is the head, the acting head of the college, and stays there for a year or two. And then he goes north again, but uh, he goes north towards Venice and towards Padua which is another great centre, both of them, Venice and Padua, which is a university of the Republic of Venice. He goes there again to continue his studies. Greek, of course, but also at this point he takes his medical degree at the medical school in Padua, which is one of the great European schools of medicine at this point. Then, oh, and he does something else. He translates from Greek into Latin, an important early text, which is published by the great Venetian printer, Aldus Manusius. He also spends a lot of time and money. How's he got his money? Well, doctors in those days were clergy. What we've got to remember is all the professions and the going to talk about this at length in a separate video. All the professions spring from the clergy. That's their origins. And as a doctor, he's a clergyman, uh, which means he gets rewarded because he's fashionable and close to royal circles. He gets rewarded with lots and lots of rich benefices in the church, from which, of course, he is an absentee. So he's got plenty of money to spend. And what does he spend it on? He spends it on accumulating manuscripts. Greek manuscripts, which, after the fall of Byzantium and whatever, are quite common in Italy. Um, whose manuscripts? Well, they're nearly all by a single figure. The great physician of late antiquity, Galen. Uh, he's born um, in Pergamum, in the modern Turkey, and then he becomes imperial physician in Rome to the great Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, and to his very deplorable son, uh, Commodus. Uh, and he publishes the great body of medical writings of late antiquity. And the manuscripts are collected by, by Lineker, clearly with a view to transcribing them and translating them and publishing them in this new medium of print, because again, Italy and particularly Venice is one of the great centres of the printing trade. So here he's done, he's had this wonderful 10 years in Italy, actually not at all unusual for the early Tudor elite, so many of them have a similar experience. 10 full years in Italy, he comes back to England, probably the most perfect scholar in ancient Greek in Northern Europe, right up there 
in the top handful. Uh, he's also got this lifelong interest in a particular figure of late antiquity, um, Galen, um, and it's that double interest. He's, he, he is both a humanist, that's to say Linnaker, a, a scholar of the languages uh, in which Galen wrote and the language which much, far more people could read at the time, Latin, and he is expert enough to produce these astonishingly idiomatic and accurate. The translations have never been bettered, not even in the 19th century. Indeed, some scholars, sorry, I am reciting other scholars on this point. I can't judge myself, but the scholars who can say that his translations are actually better than the original because the, 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 the manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts, aren't of course the originals, they're later copies, and they've often been corrupted. And his corrections to the corruptions are, you know, as good as any scholar can possibly do. So he comes back with the fame as a scholar, as a humanist, and as a physician. And he gets very rapid promotion in the Tudor world, which is very keen on these things. It moves to the heart of the Tudor court. Uh, he meets people like Thomas More and becomes friends with them. He meets Erasmus, uh, the great Dutch scholar, on his English trips and probably works with him on his Greek as well, because Erasmus is self-taught in Greek, you know, unlike, uh, un unlike Lineker himself. And we see him actually becoming both tutor and doctor to the royal children, to the short-lived Prince Arthur, uh, then to Henry VIII himself as doctor, not tutor, uh, when he comes to the throne uh, in 1509, uh, and then to Henry, briefly, tutor to Henry's daughter, uh, Princess Mary, uh, in the 1520s, when she's subject to the full weight of this astonishing learning. The other thing that he does whilst he's in England at this point, um, so he's a royal doctor, um, uh, a clergyman, vastly rich, vastly learned, private entree into the circles of the court as both a scholar and a medic. He's also working very much in London. Doctor in London, uh, the royal court essentially based around London. And whilst he's there, he moves in these high, again, clerical, humanist, scholarly circles, which are engaged in all sorts of educational activities. One of the most important is the foundation uh, of St Paul's School by the great London, uh, a great man who inherits a great London fortune. He's a, he's a major cleric, he's the Dean of St Paul's, John Collett, and he founds St Paul's School and he deliberately vests it, got the control of it, away from the church in the hands of the Mercer's Company. And the uh, the foundation documents the the, the foundation um, um, what we want to call them statutes of St Paul's specify that the new approaches to Latin and Greek are to be taught. And as part of that process, um, Lineker is invited to produce a grammar for the school, a Latin grammar for the school. I'm afraid it is just very overcomplicated and um, contains some actual surprising mistakes. So John Collett politely says, no, thank you. Um, but the relationship uh, between Lineker and the high master of St. Paul's, um, a, ma um, uh, a, a man called William Lely, uh, continues. Uh, he even offers him, uh, that's Lineker, even offers Lely uh, some se very, very serious medical advice, which is, under any circumstances, try to avoid having an operation. Good counsel then, perhaps, uh, bearing in mind iatrogenic, that's to say, hospital-given diseases, not bad advice even nowadays. So he's moving in these circles. But his great achievement, and the thing that this is so real surviving monument, now that the Nicka College is being renamed, his sole real surviving monument is the foundation in 1518 of the Royal College of Physicians. Um, he is its first head and um, 
uh, it meets to begin with in his house, his personal house, his fine house in Knight Rider Street, very near to St Paul's, just to the south of St Paul's, uh, where, whereas you know, the, the, the school uh, is to the north in, in, in the churchyard. Um, and uh, after his death um, in the mid-1520s, he leaves the house to the Royal College as its first headquarters and meeting place. So the Royal College of Physicians. What is it, what it's intended to do? Well, it is the direct ancestor of the present Royal College. Uh, so much so uh, that um, in 2018, that's 500 years after its foundation, I was invited to give the 500th anniversary lecture in the Royal College of Physicians, uh, which is now no longer in Knight Rider Street, but in an abominable Dennis Lasden building, which defaces a corner of Regent's Park. So the foundation of the college, um, the professional organisation of physicians, um, and the ambition of the Royal College, founded under the direct patronage of Henry, uh, who is himself very, very interested in medicine. Henry VIII who was very interested in medicine. <laughs> On the subject of Henry's interest in it, um, there's a wonderful story told that Henry is in conversation with a man called Brian Tuke, who is the treasurer of his chamber. We have a lovely Holbein portrait of him. He's terribly sort of anxious and... Um, rather typical uh, uh, awkward bureaucrat and uh, poor old Tuke was suffering probably I would guess uh, from maybe it's piles uh, uh, maybe uh, it's actually a hernia anyway something down there and when he hears the symptoms Henry who fancies himself as a doctor too in a very loud voice gives the poor man in English a prescription for as Tuke puts it in an embarrassed letter, ob tumore testiculorum, for a tumour on the testicles. And of course, poor old Tuke writhes red uh, with embarrassment. So that's Henry fancying himself as a doctor and therefore taking a very personal interest in the foundation of the Royal College, as indeed does his great, at this point, reforming minister, uh, Thomas Wolsey. The college is intended to be essentially what it is now, a regulatory professional body, and it is given, at least in theory, oversight uh, over the training and appointment as a procedure of examination uh, for physicians in London and potentially over all England, apart from those careful exclusion clause who've been trained at Oxford and Cambridge. But this is by... It's founded by Royal Letters Patent, and Royal Letters Patent can't have a full effect in law. So in the Parliament of 1523, the Letters Patent setting up the Royal College of Physicians are further reinforced by statute, and that does give them power over all England. But of course, it is hugely controversial. It is a trade union, <laughs> like a trade union now. It's a monopoly as doctors are now. So that's the one side of the foundation of the Royal College. But it's quite clear that Lineker has hugely greater ambitions than that. And to understand those ambitions, we've now got to go back to when he was a much younger man, when he's learning his Greek and perfecting his Greek in Italy, when he's acquiring those manuscripts by Galen. Because what... And the sees the college as being is the agency, not simply for the regulation of medicine, but for the transformation of medicine by going back to the original texts of Galen, which he had in his possession, which he was transcribing, which he was translating, and which he was having published in a series of volumes that appear right through the early 1520s. That, he thought, would transform the history of medicine. Now, it's a funny thought to us, isn't it, that you get your medicine not out of experiments, not out of vivisection, not out of dissection, not out of actually observing cases, but you get it out of books. But that was what they thought. Remember, 
This is what the whole period of what we call the Renaissance is about. Uh, I've already mentioned, I think several times, uh, right at the beginning of the Renaissance uh, with the work of Geoffrey Chaucer, the English poet, who again is soaked in Italy, travels to Italy. His wonderful quote, which summarises the ambitions of the Renaissance, old books from which new learning springs. The idea that if you could recover what the Greeks and the Romans, that civilization that lies behind the Middle Ages, that civilization, the classical civilization, which lies behind the Middle Ages, and which it was the ambition of the Renaissance to first recover, and then perhaps to exceed. But we're now in the stage of recovery, but recovery with a notion that it can transform the old books that will give rise to new learning. And in medicine and the recovery of Galen, Thomas Lineker is the absolute European centre of this process. London is the centre, the Royal College is the centre, the court of Henry VIII is the centre. There is a very direct an extraordinarily important parallel. At the beginning of my talk, I mentioned those two figures, Erasmus and Luther. Look at those dates again. The foundation of the Royal College in 1518. It's just two years later, isn't it, that there was the most famous example of this old books being re-edited and new learning springing from them. It is Erasmus's great edition of the New Testament, um, which is worked upon very largely again in England. It's a translation from the what he thought was the original Greek of the New Testament into Latin, and it's a deliberately reforming translation, which, like the translations that were being produced by Thomas Lineker, tries to go back to the original text. Um, again, he's helped by an Englishman, particularly, uh, not so much, it may indeed have been Lineker giving him some help, but much more directly by a man of a younger generation who'd again had this soaking in Italy, Tom, uh, a man called uh, a northerner too, like me, uh, rejoicing in the wonderful name of Cuthbert Tunstall, uh, named after St Cuth Cuthbert of Durham, and indeed he will eventually become Bishop of Durham, uh, having been Bishop of London before that. Anyway, Tunstall um, helps Erasmus in this extraordinary enterprise of the revised Greek-Latin uh, New Testament. Erasmus gives it a very interesting name. He doesn't just call it my new translation of the New Testament from Greek into Latin. He calls it the, uh, the Novum Organum, the new instrument, thing for doing things. Well, what does it do? Well, what it does is produce Luther, the new learning that springs from Erasmus's Novum Organum is Luther. And that's the year between, that's 1517, that the 99 theses are nailed up in another university in Wittenberg. So in religion, in theology, the idea of getting back to the texts, what they, the old books from which new learning springs, it's called also ad fontes, back to the sources, in theology. The recovery of the New Testament, uh, the astonishing radicalism of the New Testament, uh, separating it from the veil uh, which had been drawn over it uh, by the accepted translation, uh, the, 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 the Jerome translation called the Vulgate, the medieval translation, stripping back that to the original Greek was simply revolutionary. It leads to the Martin Luther's attack on indulgences and the whole apparatus uh, of the late medieval church, which culminates in the first the German and then the English and all the other reformations. So it's genuinely revolutionary. What Lineker thought he was doing with medicine was that he thought that by going back 
to the best of the medical texts of the ancient world, which he saw, of course, as having been corrupted uh, by the, uh, the translations that were used in the Middle Ages, which were effectively translations of translations. Uh, the works of Galen had been looked at uh, by the Arabic physicians of the first great age of the Islamic world, when there, there is that wonderful collision between Greco-Roman civilization and Islam, which leads to that one moment at which Islam is actually intellectually cutting edge. So Galen had first been translated uh, into Arabic, and then the Middle Ages discover him through uh, Latin translations of the Arabic. Uh, here we've got Linnica saying, no, that won't do. That introduces misunderstanding, distortion, um, interpolation. I'm going to go back to the original text, and that's what he does. In that series of publications in the early 1520s, for the first time, the central works of Galen are presented to a European audience through, of course, the new medium of, publish uh, the new medium of publishing through print. They're presented to a European audience in their ex full extent and fully and accurately and precisely rendered into Latin. And to make sure that, that this actually is incorporated into medical education, we're going to come round to Oxford and Cambridge eventually, um, uh, Lineker leaves a large chunk of his fortune each to the two universities to found new lectureships in medicine that will effectively teach the Galenic texts that he's published himself. Neither, I'm afraid, of those donations really works. So here we have... A moment, a moment at which they thought, Lineker thought, Henry VIII thought, Wolsey thought, medicine had been completely reformed. There was a new medicine that went back to the authentic work of the ancients, of course, who on one reading knew everything. So medicine could be reformed in just the same way that Luther had reformed religion. Well, of course, we know it didn't turn out. Uh, Galen made lots of mistakes. He understood the human body, I'm afraid, largely by dissecting monkeys uh, rather than human bodies. And there's quite a lot of difference between a monkey and a human being. Um, he didn't properly understand the circulation of the blood and all sorts of other things. This is not to diminish him at all, but the root of medicine was not through the recovery of the text of the ancient world. It was through processes of experimentation, of dissection, of observation, of things, facts, not just words. But it's an astonishing ambition. And it's this what if, because Henry VIII doesn't actually think it was a what if. I mentioned Henry's extraordinary interest in medicine. Well, this leads to very close relations between Henry and his doctors. Interestingly enough, it's one of Henry VIII's physicians, physician of a later generation, a man called William Butts, Sir William Butts, who is I think we could say, safely say the first Harley Street physician. Of course, Harley Street's many hundreds of years in the future. But he's the first layman uh, to be a notable doctor. As I said, before the Reformation, uh, leading physicians were clerics. He's the first layman to be a notable doctor. Uh, he's also the first doctor to be knighted. And again, uh, we have a wonderful portrait of him by Holbein in which he looks every inch a modern Harley Street physician with this long, beautifully washed white hair, perfect skin, slightly uh, rosy complexion, you know, just a benign expression. I'm sure he had a brilliant bedside manner. Of course, he rises <laughs> largely uh, through having uh, allegedly, uh, because God knows what he actually did, seen at least Anne Boleyn through the sweating sickness, uh, the terrible sweating sickness of 1528 that actually makes his career. Anyway, um, Butts is part of this new world of that connects Henry with medicine and through Butts again uh, with 
that reformed religion that we were talking about. And Butts is one of the prime figures that uh, negotiates between Henry VIII and the other principal medical body in London, which is the, uh, the company, the Worshipful Company of Barber Surgeons. And the Worshipful Company of Barber Surgeons is a livery company because, of course, the barbers and the surgeons are rude mechanics. The physicians are the learned scholars. The barber surgeons, well, they are, you know, as I said, the rude mechanicals. They do the nasty business of sawing up bones and chopping up bodies and uh, supervising dissection in their anatomy theatre. And they're, of course, actually the future of medicine, uh, but that's a different matter. Anyway, uh, Henry VIII is very interested in them. He becomes their patron. They are refounded, uh, and uh, in the uh, 1540s, there is a magnificent portrait of Henry VIII giving the refoundation charter to uh, the assembled mass of the barbers and surgeons uh, with the royal physicians on one side. Uh, it's owned by the successor company, the, um, the Worshipful Company of Surgeons, of which I am very proud to be a liveryman, and it's through that that I have my interest in Tudor medicine. But the important thing about this painting, apart from the fact it's Holbein's last authentic painting, it shows extraordinary images of all the inner members of the royal court, the barbers and the surgeons. It shows images of the royal physicians and that portrait um, of, uh, of uh, 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 William Butts that I mentioned is one of the preparatory portraits uh, for, for, for um, this great painting. It's also got an extraordinary inscription on it, which takes us into the heart of this process that I talked about. The idea that going back enables you to go forward and, in a word, to reform. By the 1540s, of course, Henry had fully espoused semi-Lutheran style, and I say semi because Henry and Luther hate each other and Henry never accepts Lutheranism, but you've adopted a kind of Erasmian Lutheran reform of the church. You've published a Bible in English uh, which is very much based on uh, Erasmus's New Testament and you've got rid of so many of the quote-unquote superstitions in the church, the ones that are not biblical, that are not endorsed uh, by the gospel, uh, which uh, Luther had first objected to in uh, 1517. So there's a parallel, isn't there, between what Luther succeeds in doing, based on Erasmus's uh, great Novum Morganum, that uh, Latin translation, new Latin translation of the Greek New Testament. There's a parallel between that what's actually done by Erasmus, Luther, Henry VIII, the reform, the reformation of the church, and what Porold Lineker hoped to do with the similar work of transcribing, copying, printing, and a good new translation of Galen. We see the former as the beginning of the great avenue of religious change. We see the latter poor old Lineker as a cul-de-sac. But in the 1540s, both processes seem to be the key to the future. And the inscription on the great painting, the great barber surgeon's portrait, um, actually says that. And I'd like to read it to you because it takes us into the absolute heart of what Henry VIII, Lineker, Erasmus and the rest were doing. And it's inscribed too. It's in Latin, of course, but this is the translation. To Henry VIII, best and greatest king of England, France and Ireland, defender of the faith and, next to Christ, supreme head of the English and Irish church, the company of surgeons dedicates these lines with united prayer. A grievous plague could ravage the land of England, afflicting the spirits and besetting the bodies of the people. God, pitying from on high the great mortality, bade you, this is addressed to the king, undertake the office of a good physician. The plague, well, Tudor England was ridden by the plague, but this is talking about two sorts of plague. It's talking about the actual physical plague, 
sweating sickness and everything else. And it's also talking about the plague of corruption in the church. And it's presenting the king as the reformer of both. So what did the king do? It continues, the light of the gospel flies round on glowing wings. This is Henry having ordered the publication of the Great Bible, the new reformed translation of the Bible in English. The light of the gospel flies round on glowing wings. This will be the medicine for disordered minds. Right. But at the same time, it says, by your counsel, this is their bodies, men honour the works of Galen and every disease is swiftly aided and dispelled. In other words, it's comparing the work of Linnica with Galen to the work of Erasmus and Luther with the New Testament and seeing Henry as the executor, the man who's responsible for applying these intellectual programmes to England. We therefore, it continues, a suppliant band of your doctors and um, solemnly dedicate this house to you, that's the company of barber surgeons, and mindful of the favours which you, Henry, have blessed us, we invoke the greatest blessings on your rule. So that is what Oxford is rejecting in favour of the bikini billionaire.